Okay, be, uh, before we uh, get down to the uh, business at hand, I want to tell you I'm not supposed to do this, not supposed to date it, but this class is being brought, is being taped on President's Day. Why are we working on President's Day? And I want you to know there are still a few people around the university and the faculty who think it's okay to be a patriot. I'm wearing my Patriots tie. Maybe you can see the Lutons character with Uncle Sam hands. Uh, and I wear a Patriots tie again on Wednesday, which will actually be George Washington's real birthday. I'll probably have a tie with a picture of George Washington on it. And so uh, it's all right to be proud to be an American, and it's okay to be proud of the good things this country has done. It's really the first experiment in true democracy, and uh, there have been glitches along the way, but uh, I think it's better to pitch in and try to make it better than to try to rip it down. Okay, the second thing I want to say is we have a pearl of wisdom from last week. If you remember, um, Francis, who gave the talk on behaviorism, uh, and I uh, corrected something I had to say. I might add that at the beginning I said she knows the stuff better than I do. So from this, don't worry, I, I figured it out. But first let me tell you, from this you learn something. There's nothing wrong with having students who know something better than you do. Okay? There's nothing wrong with having students correct you, even elementary school students, right? Uh, and then you should go back and look it up. Um, and this can occur in all kinds of stuff. For instance, I, um, there's a book that I saw on uh, multiculturalism and understanding other people's culture. And there was a page and a half in there on Jewish culture. Um, in four paragraphs, there were six mistakes. Okay. Now, I read about some of the other cultures. I don't know, but I got to believe <laughs> that, that, that they didn't just pick, say, okay, we're going to take this culture and say everything wrong about them. So you might be teaching some course on multiculturalism. Some kid will say, hey, you know, that's not the way it is. That's my cultural background. Instead of saying, all right, it's in the book, and I'm the teacher, you might want to take a look. Even elementary school students say, hey, let's go look it up. So I did that. And I went back and I took a look and I discussed it with someone else. Uh, and and uh, 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 Francis uh, and I were both kind of right, okay? What she said is that when you're on an interval schedule, let me see if I can get back, on an interval schedule where you're given a reinforcement every so often, and as long as you do it, you get rewarded, right? That you tend to get erratic work. She was right, okay? In other words, if the rat's banging on the bar, or if you know, you know, as long as I do enough, if, if I, even if I get warded intermittently, if the animal, if the person figures out a word Skinner wouldn't use, but if the rat's just sitting there and all of a sudden the food falls down, right, because within that 45 second period, right, the rat hit on the bar enough times, right, then, and the rat's figured out, well, as long as I hit some, it'll come out, or a person certainly can figure it out, she's right. What I'm talking about is a schedule that says, and this is the way it usually is, okay, you've had enough hits on the bar, the time's up, but now you have to have at least one more hit before I'm going to reward you, right? Like a slot machine that's on time. So the slot machine will say, okay, I'm ready to pay off, but you've got to put in the money and pull the lever one more time or hit the button one more time before you're going to be paid off. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in other words, you have to perform the work in order to be paid off. Okay, and that is almost impossible to tell from a variable ratio. Understand what I'm saying? If in a variable interval, the payoff says, look, I'm going to reward you every so often, provided that you did X amount of work in that time. And let's say it's a 45-second it's a one. So my next payoff by the drug is going to be after 15, if it's going to be after 25 seconds, let's say. Okay, right? The rat hangs around, hits the bar a couple of times, then 25 seconds goes by, and bang, out comes the fool with the rat just staring at it. You're not going to get a lot of work. You understand? This, this is on a variable interval, right? On a variable interval. But if I say, look, the, after the 25 seconds, okay, now you're ready to reward. Now you're ready to do it, but the rat's got to hit the bar one more time before I'm going to let it go, which is usually the way it is in real life, right? You've got to have the behavior done. 
then it, you get a lot of steady work. Bang, 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 bang. It's very hard to tell the difference. So I did what you ought to do if you have a disagreement or if you think you're right, you have to go back and look it up. So she was right. If, the, if it's going to come no matter what, then you're not going to get a steady, work, steady rate of work with variable interval. But if you have to, even if, in other words, if the rat's banging the bar, right, and you, let's say you're on a, let's say it's 45 seconds, you're on a minute, and the rat's banging, bangs the bar and then stops, right, and then stops after 30 seconds, and, go, and the minute comes, and bang, out drops the food, you're not going to get work. But if I say, look, I don't care if five minutes goes by, until that rat hits that bar one more time, the food's not coming, then you're going to get a steady rate of work. Okay? All right, any questions about that? I hope I didn't confuse people more than I helped, but in any case, the main thing is to remember, you don't have to be the conveyor of all knowledge. If you make a mistake, you make a mistake. Now, I admit that's in line with my idea of the teacher doesn't have to be the wellspring of all knowledge. And learning theory pretty much feels that's true. I decide what you're going to learn, how you're going to do it. But if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. Admit it. Okay? I'll tell you, I had one thing. I just got to tell you this story, I, I, right? Did I tell the story about why was Rochester founded? I don't know if I told you that, right? I told you that, and, and the teacher said, why did, and I said to him, why did Rochester, Nathaniel Rochester, found Rochester when there were other towns around there? And he said, I don't know, I'll ask him. When I see him, I think I told this story, right? right? That's not how a good teacher acts. Because he said, you know, that's a good question. As it happened, you can see it stuck in my mind. So I was 10, it was a long time ago. Years later, when I was studying New York State history again, and they were pointing out the founding of the major cities in the state, they pointed out that the other towns were farming towns, and he wanted to have an industrial town. So he found he needed a place on the river where he could use the falls in the river. There was a series of waterfalls in the river. There was an answer. She just didn't know it. Right? And he used the falls for power. So you got to be careful. You don't know, so you don't know. Okay, if you make a mistake, say I made a mistake. It's okay. People, the students have more respect for you, not less. Okay, let's talk about some problems with learning theory. Let's go to the PowerPoint. Okay, because of logical contradictions in the theory, the theory is there's no one to set the goals, and the term reinforcement does, gives, doesn't really mean anything. Okay, aside from that, we're in good shape. Okay, I'm going to do this one first, the term reinforcement. Okay. Let's take a vote first. How many people here, and you do it in your own, in your own, uh, in your own hearts, those of you watching on tape, have heard the term reinforcement? And you pretty much are familiar with what it is. OK, well, tell me what it is, because I can't figure it out to save the life of me. Let's say I have a student. Push it down. Jennifer. Jennifer. OK, we'll make it easy. Jennifer. Here, Jennifer, wave to the crowd. There she is here. Okay. Jennifer doesn't sit in her seat very much. I don't even have to shape. She's in her seat about a fifth of the time I want her in there. So somebody says to me, you want her in her seat? What she do when she does sit in her seat, provide a reinforcement. That sounds, so far I'm feeling pretty good. But what's the reinforcement? You've got to tell me what's a reinforcement. You all said you knew what it was. Somebody tell me. Okay, Jennifer's going to tell me, right? Isn't it um, either rewarding or providing a reward or a consequence to Well, it's not a consequence. Or it's got to be something that will increase the behavior, right? Mm -hmm. no. So it's providing a reward that will... Go ahead, go ahead. That will increase the behavior to... Okay, that's good. So it's something that will increase the behavior. That's what I asked. So what is it? How do I know what it is for Jennifer? Go ahead. It depends on each child what they value enough to increase the behavior. It depends on each child. So now remember, I'm convinced that, that Jennifer's behavior, behavior can be changed. That's why I'm asking the question, what will it change it? So you're telling me it depends on each child. So OK, good. So how do I know it'll do it for Jennifer? What? Go ahead. Trial and error. Trial and error. Go ahead, go ahead. 
You can ask her parents. Sarah, parents. right? Uh huh. Rosanna. Rosanna, see, I do it. <laughs> Got it right. Go ahead, Rosanna. <laughs> you can ask the parents. The parents normally know what, what works as far as taking away or giving to the kid. You can ask the parents. So if I ask the parents, is that bound to work? Go ahead. Go ahead, say it. It's not bound to work. Better success rate, so chance. Huh. I'm going to call you Sarah for the rest of the year. I know it now. <laughs> this is semester. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm confused here. I mean, I mean, you know, so go I mean, ahead. That can be different because some, the children sometimes act differently at school than they do with their parents. Kids act differently with teachers than they do with parents. Let me ask Rosanna a question. If I ask the parents and I get a reinforcement and it works and I get Rosanna to sit in her seat more, next thing I want Rosanna to do is pick up her pen and write. Can I be guaranteed that that reinforcement will work for that? I got to say something. No. No. I'm not getting I'm, I'm starting to get so confused. I don't know what's going on here. I'm getting a headache. Go ahead. Well, it's kind of more of a comment for the previous, but it kind of falls on the teacher to get to know their children. You can't rely always on what the parents say. Get to know the children. Okay. Go ahead. Well, sometimes it's kind of like the children has the parent trained, so the children right. know what works and what doesn't work for the parent, and not necessarily the not same necessarily case. Not necessarily for the kid. Well, so, so to get to know the kids, so in other words, what you're telling me is I should guess. I should figure, well... She likes to play basketball, so if she sits in her seat, I let her go outside and play basketball. Or she likes candy, so if she sits in her seat, is that what you're telling me? Sort of guess. I'm going to guess based on my observations, and it. Let's try this. Is there something that's always a reinforcement? Praise. Wait a second. Praise is always a reinforcement. So you're guaranteeing me if I praise someone, I can get that person to do whatever I want the person to do. Anybody, anybody, is there anybody here who gets uncomfortable with praise? That one person. Anybody here who, a couple people, who say that person's praising me because, say he's, he, he, he's trying to brown nose me and it turns me off. Anybody ever think that? So sometimes praise can be a punishment, right? I'm not going to do that. You're trying to butter me up. Is there, is there something that's never a reinforcement? Flogging. Flogging? <laughs> Man, you, you haven't been downtown lately, <laughs> looking in the bookstores. But, but um, aren't there some kids, haven't you been told sometimes that doing very negative things to kids actually reinforces them because it's the only way they can get attention? So there's nothing that's always a reinforcement, but everything is a potential reinforcement, right? Is that right? So how do I know? What if I make a guess? Tell, tell me your name. Becky. Say it again. Becky. Becky. Okay, Becky, let's say I, um, I give it a shot here with, with uh, what was the first behavior? With a sitting down behavior for Jennifer, right? And it works. Okay, I've looked at her, I see she really likes Skittles. Anybody here hates Skittles? See, there are a few of us. Who thinks we're nuts, right? <laughs> I don't like food. I don't like fruit candy. If you're gonna eat candy, it's gotta be chocolate already. All right? So are you pretty sure then that if I want um, the next behavior, if I wanted to write, that giving her the Skittles will work for that too? You pretty sure? No, I mean it you know, if she associates Skittles with sitting down, then No, but I mean what about if I want her to how many people here? would rather walk on glass than get up and give an impromptu speech. How many people here 
If I offered you a dollar, we'd give an impromptu speech for five minutes on nuclear physics. You figure, what the hell, a buck's a buck. Who'd do that? <laughs> right? Three or four hours. I would. I don't care. I could, <laughs> who figures five? For five for hours. It was a buck I didn't have. For five minutes, I could be outside there. So who, 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 who would, get, would get really uptight about it? Oh, a lot of people. Okay, so let's say that a Jennifer was one of them, okay? So let's say that Jennifer sits down in her seat because I'll give her Skittles. Now, are you pretty sure that she'd also give an impromptu speech for Skittles? Would you? Do you like Skittles? They're all right. They're all right. What's your favorite candy? Snickers. Snickers, obviously. I love Snickers. OK, so if she would sit down in her seat for Snickers, who doesn't like Snickers? Oh, my god. I can't believe it. <laughs> Who loves Snickers? <laughs> yeah, right? Most people. You see, I I'm asking this question not because I'm being silly, but because when we get to Bandura, you're going to see that this is a real problem. Okay? So are you pretty sure that then she'd get, a, get up and give an impromptu speech for Snickers? I get her to sit in her seat, or I give her a little mini Snickers bar. How many people think she might sit down, but I'm not so sure about the impromptu speech. Do you really freak out about that? Yeah, she said, yeah, she's going like this. You know, she's got a look on her face like she wants to throw up, <laughs> right? All right, go ahead. Maybe if you gave her a king-size Snickers for the impromptu speech, she'd do it. It might. That's right. The size of the reward makes a difference. Remember that we said that last time. Maybe, though. You hear the word maybe. So here's what you're telling me. How many people think it's really a matter of trial and error? Trial and error. So here's what you're telling me. Look. What trial and error is, is a fancy way of saying, I don't know. I don't know. Anything could reinforce her. On the other hand, you know, it could be anything. You try something, it might not reinforce her. And if it does, it might not reinforce for the next behavior. So what you're telling me is, in order to get Jennifer to behave, to behave the way you want, to get her to sit down, try something. If it doesn't work, try something else. If it doesn't work, try something else. Or say, and I don't, it's saying, bumble around until something works. If it doesn't work, it's not a reinforcement. Try something else. If it doesn't work, no. And when it works, call it a reinforcement. This is what? <laughs> Who knows what this is? Let's go. Oops, whoops, whoops. Let's go back. Oh, my God. All right, wait a second. I got a message here that's telling me to do something. Okay. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Look, let's try this. In order to get a behavior to increase, provide a reinforcement whenever the behavior occurs. That's what you all told me, right? Now, reinforcement is an environmental stimulus that increases a behavior. Okay? That's the definition. So let me substitute this definition right in here for the word reinforcement, okay? See what I'm going to do? I'm going to write this sentence again, but instead of using the word reinforcement, I'm going to substitute the definition of reinforcement. That ought to work, okay? And I'm going to even do it, this in blue, and I'm going to keep this in black, okay? In order to get a behavior to increase, provide an environmental stimulus that increases a behavior when other behavior occurs. It tells me a lot. To get a behavior to increase, give a behavior increaser. <laughs> Come back to me. Okay, what's a behavior increaser? I, I don't know. Could be this, could be that, could be the other thing. Trial and error, try until you uh, figure it out. Okay, what is this? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. This is a what? Circular, circular, thank you very much. This is a classical circle explanation. And it, gives, and it gives us no information as to how to get a behavior to, to change. That's what trial and error means. It means I have no idea. Try some. If it works, try something else. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, come back to me for a second. There were several of you who gave the recommendations that behaviorists give, which is to say, well, take a look. Try to see. Ask the parents. Get to know the kid. Okay? And this was formalized in something called the PREMAC principle. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. The word PREMAC means it's the name of the person who figured it out, okay? Somebody named Premag did it, okay? And this is, again, an unsuccessful attempt to overcome the circularity problem. Here's what Premag said. 
A behavior that naturally occurs frequently has a high probability of reinforcing behavior that naturally occurs less frequently. Now I'll say it in English for you, okay? Here's the translation, okay? Using something a pupil likes, this is a word that Skinner would never use, that's why you have to do it this way, that behaviors would, to, the, using something a kid likes to do is over something a kid doesn't like to do, okay? That has a high probability of working, okay? So for instance, if I, I see that all things being equal, come back to me for a second, all things being equal, Jennifer, if I just leave her alone, right, if I just leave her alone, we'll pick up paper and pencil and start to draw, I'll tell her, you know, I'll use drawing time for her sitting in, in, her, in her seat. Or if I see all things being equal, Jennifer will run over and start to, you know, go into her bag and take out Snickers bars, so I'll use, because she likes to eat Snickers, I'll use Snickers bars as a reinforcement. And, back to the PowerPoint, sorry for jumping around so much, like every other proposed reinforcement, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It'll work for some behaviors and not for others. The term doesn't mean anything. Now, those of you who said, who said get to know the child? Becky, right? Of course, Becky hit on the, on the key problem here, which is that Skinner has no interest in knowing the child, quote unquote. What are the kids' likes? What are the kids' dislikes? What are the kids' principles? What are the kids' morals, right? Or an adult's principles or morals? I assume, come back to me, that most of you would wash my car if I gave you $50,000. I am hoping that if you ever got into a situation where you had government secrets, that you would not sell them uh, to terrorists for $50,000. I, I have to believe that. Right? I'm, hoping it would, uh, I'm hoping with all hope, right? So it depends on the behavior, okay? Some people here would get up and give an impromptu speech for, you know, that's values. Some company has personality. Some people here, how many people here you can't imagine enough money to get up and give an impromptu speech on a topic you know nothing about? The thought just terrifies you. How many people have that feeling? And how many people would just reach into a bag and pick it when I don't care, right? We had that three or four of us, five, six people. What do I care, right? It has to do with personality. How many people give speeches better when they're impromptu, impromptu speeches than when they're well-planned. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? There are about six or seven of us. And how many people really have to plan it out before you're ready to get up and talk? Right? That's about double the number in here. You're going to have to decide yourself, those who are on the film, but you can see personality makes a difference. There are some behaviors, you hardly have to give me any reward, I'll do it. And some behaviors for which um, no reward. Once I, I asked someone, talk about that, well, what about, take a, what about killing your children? Is there any word you I had one person raise their hand. She said, I have three teenagers. She said, some days I feel like I do it for free, <laughs> right? So <laughs> they drive me crazy. So, I mean, obviously she was kidding. But you have to, so, and it, 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 Skinner doesn't tell us anything. It just doesn't tell us anything because... Once again, we're stuck with this idea of circularity, right? In order to give, a reinforcement is a behavior increaser. So in order to increase a behavior, give a behavior increaser. And the idea of we'll get to know the person's values and personalities and likes, etc. he doesn't want to hear from that. We're going to hear that soon from, from Bandura. Okay, the other problem is, this is a little more esoteric. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. If we stick to the logic of the theory, there's no one to set the goals. This is a little fancier, but it makes a difference from the point of view of interaction between teacher and student, okay? Here's what the theory says. This is called the self-excluding or the self-accepting, everyone except me, fallacy, okay? It's a logical error. Remember we talked about fallacies? Okay, look, in this theory, people are viewed as being passive. 
Now, passive doesn't mean, passive doesn't mean, come back to me for a second so we can talk this a little more, doesn't mean that they're sitting there like this. A person could be running around and be passive. Passive means, the question of active and passive has the following question. It's the relationship, here, let me go to the, up to the tablet, of the environment, environment, the relationship, I'm going to write fast because I can do that faster, of the environment and the person. Okay, passive theories say that the environment shapes the person. That's what Skinner says. People are, except for those few innate behaviors with which they're born, okay, people are shaped by their environment, right? They're passive. And active theory would say, oh, no, oh, no. When some stimulus comes in from the environment, people are actively thinking about it, making sense of it, putting it through their, right? So if, come back to me for a second. So if... If I say, so those people would say, if I say, God, that's a nice sweater you have on to somebody here. People are ever going to say, that's, that comment, whether that comment is an insult or a, could be an insult, right? For instance, yesterday I was at a wedding. Everybody's wearing a suit, and some person comes in with a tie and a sweater. If I got up to that person and said, I mean, this is true, right? And said, gee, what a nice sweater that is. <laughs> Obviously, I'm trying to insult the person, right? Or maybe the person doesn't take it as an insult, right? <laughs> Active people are going to say, people are going to, the environmental stimulus is going to be a function of how the person understands it. When we get to Piaget, you're going to say, see, that's completely true. Okay? Kids have their own way of thinking about things, and they're going to understand everything based on the way they think about things. They don't care what you say. Don't try your logic. I know you're taller than he is. You're older than he is. I don't care if you tell me he's your father. It's irrelevant. That's not part of how I understand the environment. Okay, so for Skinner, people are very passive. They have no free will. They're shaped by the environment. That's what he's promising you. That's why all these learning theories are so appealing to people who are in schools and teachers need to control. I'm going to shape you. If you can just get the, control the environment in the right way, you can get kids to do whatever they want. But if that's true, let's go back to the PowerPoint. If that's true, then who decides on the behavioral objectives? Who has the free will to do that? Who's going to analyze the data? Who has the will to shape others? In other words, Skinner is saying, look, everyone is passive except the person doing the shaping. Everyone's being shaped, but there's one shaper who's free from the rule. I'm excluding myself. I can make decisions. I have the free will. I can analyze data. I can decide what to do. I'm excluding myself because I'm shaping you. The, the educator using the theory has to exclude himself or herself from the, the tenets, the basic principles of the theory. You have to. You have to say, I'm not passive. Someone in here said, Sometimes kids control their parents and reinforce. I don't remember who said it, right? But exactly, right? Jennifer said it, right? But Skinner said, uh uh. You can control. Matter of fact, there's a famous cartoon when Skinner came out of two rats in, a, in his box, where, you know, hitting the pedal that, that uh, Francis described. And one is looking at the other and says, I have this stupid psychologist trained. Every time I hit the, I hit the bar, he, he gives me food, right? I have him trained. <laughs> to give me food. But the point is that in the end, Skinner has to say, no, there's someone who does have the free will to do it. This person using the theory has the free will to decide on the objectives, to analyze, to be the active shaper of the passive students who are being shaped. And that, my friends, is a logical fallacy because it means that one person 
has to be free from the rules of psychology. Everyone, well, teachers can say, well, I'm just, teachers are reinforced to do what they're, to, because they're given reinforcements and their paychecks to do what the principal wants them to do. The principal is reinforced by the, the state boards that ultimately, right, because he has to do what the people put out the tacky tests say you have to do. And on and on it goes. But in the end, somebody has to decide. There was one person that didn't like theory. He said, he said I, I accept Sinner's theory, but I can't decide who's the ultimate shaper, Skinner or God, right? He was teasing Skinner about this. Somebody has to decide. And that's, my friends, is a logical fallacy. To say, my rule of human psychology works, provided that one human being is excluded from it, that's no good. And of course, come back to me. Okay. And of course, it's what happens. So if I'm the teacher in this class, then I go and I, I, uh, I'm excluded. I decide the goals. I decide the journal. I decide what's going to nice shape all of you. Then on Tuesday night when I go to my Bible study class and I'm the, I'm the student, right? Then all of a sudden I'm passive and the teacher there can shape me. What? Right? And then he in turn, when he goes to take classes somewhere, all of a sudden he's, he can be, it just, it, it just doesn't make sense. And in fact, most educational models that have been quite successful have an interaction between learner and teacher, right? Sharing, right? Socrates always wanted to be challenged by his students, right? The students would pick the teacher in those days and try to be challenged, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, go ahead. I'm curious, Francine just taught the first half of behaviorism <coughs> because, I, because she knows it and I assume she really believes in Skinner's theory of well, behaviorism. But she the she has a good background and I don't know what she believes, but, but she's the, done it a lot more than I have. Well, I was just curious why she didn't continue with the problems associated with it and why you took All it. theories have problems, okay? But part of this has to do with the philosophy. Look, to some extent, people will tell you, look, I know that this problem is there, but it works. I take out that bag of Snickers and I can get Jennifer to do almost anything I want, particularly when it comes to behavior. By the way, behaviorism still holds sway in places like animal training, right? You know, it goes, oof, oof, goes to the ceiling, give it a fish. Then it goes, all right, it takes its mouth and goes, boom, 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 right? It's, right? it's doing it on the bells, give it a fish, right? It'll do it again, right? We do the same thing with, 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 Behaviorist approaches to uh, classroom, uh, 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 classroom uh, control, classroom management. Raise your paw. Sit. Stand. I, I picked a, an animal training example with Jennifer. Right. Sit. Stand. Up. There, right. So, to some extent, now if I'm if I'm going to say to to Jennifer, you know, I want you to sort of analyze the causes of the civil warfare. I used to be a history teacher, so that's what I do. Okay. I usually give history examples. History and an English teacher. Well, then you have to say, hmm, I wonder. But for that, it seems the, the problem is, if I ask, why is it that praise is so effective with, tell me now again? David, right? Daniel. Daniel. That's my brother's name. Why can't I remember that? Okay, it's so effective with Daniel. And Jennifer just... It doesn't work very well. Snickers are okay. And if I try to give material things to Daniel, you know, it doesn't work too well. Skinner doesn't care. So, so shut up. Use praise with Daniel and Snickers. With, with you. But in the end, trying to understand what I mean, and the problem is when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Now, of course, it always works. Because if I start giving Snickers to Daniel, he doesn't do, the behavior doesn't increase. I said, oh, it's not a reinforcement for him. See what I'm saying? That's because it's circular. But it's a good question. I mean, I, this, this theory has pretty much been, pretty much been, uh, you know, deserted, except for these kind of primitive. And you can see it used with autistic kids, too, right? Because you want these very, kids who have severe autism, these simple behaviors. And once you find the reinforcement, you can go for it. But 
the satiation, but I don't think it's much of a look. Here's one other problem with it. I can have someone list, list six causes of the Civil War, six hypothesized causes of the Civil War. And a person can put down slavery, economic differences, right? But if you're a good teacher, you say in your guts, I ought to be able to go to the kid, to the kid and say, well, can you explain how slavery caused the war? What happened with slavery? If the kid says, not really, it just listed it. Can you explain the interaction of slavery and the economic differences, what's going on here? And if people can't do that, you know, you start to feel pretty upset. How do you account for the fact that Robert E. Lee was opposed to slavery, that Judah Benjamin, the Secretary of State of the Confederacy, said, let's free the slaves on the condition that they'll fight in the Confederate Army. Right? I don't know if you knew that. Because that's the only way to preserve the Confederacy. Well, so maybe slavery was only part of it. And then I think it was Sherman, don't call me this, who was very, very anti uh, anti black. He was right. There were a lot of people in the North who had, didn't have, right, were very anti black and very, you know, they were, did something else. Well, so maybe there was something else. How does that all come together? How does that all interact? Right? What about the abolitionists, and what about Lincoln, what about this, and what about that? These are all difficult questions, and that's the kind of stuff I would have rather than listening. And people can disagree with each other. There are people who think that slavery was a key factor in the Civil War. There are some people who think that slavery was a secondary factor. Okay? So that's the, and that's the kind of thing you don't get when you're going for given answers. Right? You don't get too much creativity, right? Creativity, as a matter of fact, is bad. It's off your path toward your goal, right? So if your goal is to teach the kid how to use a scale and there's some kid who says, I'm going to take this apart and see how this thing works, right? That's no good, right? Even if you know the kid is good at taking it apart and putting it back to things, taking it apart and putting them back together, right? You know, if it's a balanced scale, let's say. So, these are some problems with this, but obviously this theory has a lot of appeal if you say, this is what you have to do, answer these questions on the pecky test. So, all right. So, let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Here you can see it doesn't make sense. So, but I, let's, let's do some of these questions here. Some of these questions are not going to be good to all the theories, okay. Obviously, according to Skinner, what should educators be trying to achieve? Okay. Obviously, the educational goals need to be behavioral objectives. Okay? And he wants to use reinforcement and extinction and, if brutally, if, if necessary, punishment. For instance, as I, I explained last time, punishment is not considered to be very effective. But if you have kids, for instance, who have severe problems, like kids who are constantly banging their head into the floor, into the wall, well, I thought then you can say, look, I, I think I said that last time, let's punish the behavior. I mean, you know, it's got to stop it. Whatever it's in its place is better than this. The kid, you know, can, can really hurt himself or herself. Okay? And the purpose of schools, obviously, is to change and shape behaviors. You have identifiable behaviors, and achievement is defined as a desired change in behavior. Okay? And all learning is the responsibility of the teacher. If a kid doesn't learn, it's the teacher's fault, 100%. This is one of, the, one of the problems that a lot of people have pointed to. It's your fault. You either didn't set the right behavioral objective or you didn't provide the proper reinforcement. And of course, you can see that you have to set, set the right objective for each individual student. You guys out there too on the camera, right? for each individual student. So to say, oh, I'm going to have the same objectives for everyone, they're all going to take the same tentative test on the same day is horrifying to Skinner. Horrifying. It'll be horrifying to every theory that we run into, right? Into which we run? Anyway, okay? You have to, so he, it's, 
okay? But all the burden of learning, because the learner is completely passive, is on the, is on the, uh, on the teacher. And the factors that cause to a lack of achievement, possibly causing a kid to be labeled, is that the teacher didn't set the right objectives. Don't start blaming the kids. Don't start blaming the kids. If a kid's not learning, do something else. And you must immediately stop doing something that the kid is not performing with. You, if you set up a behavior and the kid can't do it, stop doing it. Break it down into smaller parts. Do something else first. Stop doing it. Endless skills drills of things that kids can't understand, he thinks are a waste of time. So does everyone else. If the kid can't do it, stop doing it. What are you doing it for? Okay, so as I said, it's the fault of the educational system of the teacher. Of course, he assumed a teacher who was, who was free from bureaucratic regulations. Okay, I got it. Before I talk about the contributions of the theory, come back to me. I got to say one other thing. Um, Francis said something that uh, really yanks the chain of people who are not learning theorists, and that's Skinner said, I'm the most scientific. I'm the most scientific. I just talk about what I can see and I don't assume anything else, nothing in your head. First of all, I make no assumptions. First of all, that's obviously a tree does make assumptions about passivity of people and exactly. But more than that, that's not the most scientific, right? We talked about gravity as a theory. If Newton were a, a behaviorist, he'd say, balls fall, planets go through the sky, rivers run downhill, I'm finished. That's all I can observe. Something hypothetical, theoretical, like gravity that you can't see and touch? Some hypothetical explanation? <laughs> Whose name is Sarah? Somebody's here's name is Sarah. Nobody. <sighs> it's mental illness. Okay, let's take someone else. Who was the person who was depressed? Wasn't that you? Tell me your name anyway. We're going to be depressed now. Alexis. Say it again. Alexis. Alexis. Alexis, raise your hand. Wave to the crowd. There she is. Okay. If I see Alexis, and Alexis, we think we talked about this, right? In bed 18 hours a day, sighing and moaning, life is hopeless. I don't know. Right? Most of us would say Alexis is depressed. Depressed? Show me you're depressed. I can't see you depressed. I can't measure depressed. Just report the symptoms. So Skinner, by saying he doesn't want a theory, he doesn't want overarching understanding of things, right, is really the less scientific than others. By the way, if Alexis reports backaches, right, which is a common symptom, not complete, but a lot of people with um, depression will report, report backaches, right, and they, there doesn't seem to be... If I'm the doctor and I hear oh, this wedding I went to yesterday was two doctors getting married, the place was loaded with doctors. I couldn't believe it, right? So, but if I'm the doctor and I hear this, I'm going to move to the front of my diagnosis and treatment the thought that this is a psychosomatic symptom, quote unquote. Sure, I, if I'm a good doctor, I'll check her back anyway. Might be that she's depressed because she has constant back pains, but I'm going to check. And if I can't find her, if not, if, if she said, oh, I'm happy, I'm okay, things are okay, but this back annoys her from time to time, I'm probably going to put depression in the back, I think, right? Because I have a, 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 an overarching theory, right, of what's going on here. You have back exercises? Just wait till you get older. <laughs> All right. So you, you, you understand what I'm saying? So this is, so it's, it's not... It's not the most scientific. In many ways, it's the least scientific because it refuses to make theories and to give explanations of observations. Okay, let's go to the contributions of the theory. Okay, here are the contributions. The first thing is, Skinner talked about individualized education. You have to have, have, to have individual starting points for each kid and, at least in theory, individual reinforcements for each kid. Concentrate on what you want, not on what you don't want. I'm yelling, it means it's important. Don't spend endless times with punishing undesired behaviors. Reinforce desired behaviors. 
our schools tend to run on a punishment modality. We expect you to be good, and if you're not, we punish you. One of my sons, he was in second grade, and the teacher, he tended to be a noisy kid, right? He's the one who won the Emmy. Did I tell you my son won an Emmy? Okay. I didn't tell you, it's this first semester. Anyway, he did okay in the end. So don't worry, I'll tell you 40 more times before the semester's over. Okay, so the teacher would have a box, and in the box were five, uh, uh, I don't know, good cards, she called them. And every time you misbehaved, she took a good card out. And if at the end of the day you had at least one good card, you could go and buy stuff from the little store. So, got to school at 8 o'clock by 10.15, uh, all those good cards were gone. So I said to her, the rest of the day, she didn't know what to do. I said, why don't you find a way to earn more good cards in there if he does positive things? No, she said, he's supposed to be good. Oh, okay. Don't look at me. <laughs> I'm out of this. Right? What can you want from me? So this is, and Skinner said, that's not the way to do things. Again, because if you punish behaviors, you never know what you're going to get. You know, you go from, from this to this to this, and it's, you know, you're, when, I'm, when I pick up the pen once in a while, reinforce that. Okay. And Skinner also said, if what you're doing doesn't work, stop doing it. If the reinforcement doesn't work, find another one. If you find that the behavioral objective is something the kid can't achieve, break it down into smaller parts. Stop doing what doesn't work. Now, you're going to find that a lot of people, as we go along, so far I only have a contribution slide on this one. We'll see if we have some other ones because, you know, I, you can see I, I, this is a theory that doesn't appeal to me terribly. But are going to agree with this. Don't do what doesn't work. Concentrate on what you want. Now, this individualized education is only partially individualized because Skinner still has the same goals for everyone. Some people are going to go farther and say, why does everyone have to learn the same thing? Why? We'll get to that. Okay. Now, I'm going to get off here. Come back to me. Okay, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. I want every, I'm going to stand up. I want everyone to watch me, okay? Just watch me, watch me. Nice, no, get it on me, okay? I'm gonna do something. See how close you can get to the people. I don't know. Can you get closer to me? Guess not. Watch me. I'm gonna do something. After I do it, you repeat what I did. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Once more. Go ahead. Okay, this actually has nothing to do with the course. <laughs> I, uh, I just bet, uh, Scott, back there that I could uh, get all of you to make fools of yourselves. Uh, and I won the bet. Actually, it does. What just happened, okay, do it again. Put the camera on them. Do it again. Okay, very good. <laughs> what just happened, come back to me, Skinner has a very difficult time explaining. A very difficult time explaining. I'm having a very difficult time finding the next, you know, right? Why does he have a difficult time explaining it? Because Skinner would say, nobody received any direct reinforcement. Also, it's a pretty complex behavior. Skinner would say, you're going to have to do some kind of a, you're going to have to do some kind of a, uh, uh, nobody's going to do that naturally, right? So you're going to have to do some sort of shaping process. First reinforce a person for going like this, then for going like this, then like this, then like this, then like this, then like this, right? Build up a chain, right? Who has never played golf in your life? Never played golf? Come over here. They say once you turn 60, you have to learn how to play golf. We'll see. Okay, come over here. Come over here. Okay, tell us your name. Hugo. What? Hugo. Hugo. Okay, ready, Hugo? There's the ball. There's the hole. Okay, 
What I want you to do is show me how you swing a golf club to hit that ball to the hole. Okay, go ahead. Who plays golf? <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, how was the swing? Where's it done? That sucked, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't hear, what did he say? That sucked, man. Yeah. Minus seven, right? Yeah. Horrible. But he knew to stand sideways. He knew to put two hands on this, all right, and he knew to go here. You know, huh? How'd you know that? I didn't know. How do you ask you knew? I had to see, I had to saw someone on TV or something. I saw someone on TV, right? That's the kind of thing, give him a big hand. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I'm pretty, I saw someone on TV. That's the kind of, you saw me. That's the kind of thing that Skinner cannot explain well, okay? And ultimately, someone who started out as a, as a, a radical behaviorist like Skinner, Bandura, developed a theory which is called, let's go to the PowerPoint, social learning theory. Okay, that green background's not so hot, but what can I do? Okay, learning by observing others in society. Social learning. That's how all of you learned to do that silly thing. That's how Hugo learned to swing a golf club more or less. Now, obviously he didn't swing it too well, as Daniel told us, but at least he had a start, right? And as a matter of fact, if I said to him, look, Hugo, I'm gonna pay you $10,000 if you improve that swing just by looking. Watch everything the pros do, the swing would get better just by looking. Okay, he would know not to stop here to go over his shoulder, he'd watch that and a few other things, right? If he could, he'd watch how they hook their hands, they hook your fingers together, I never played golf, you don't do that anymore? Hooking the fingers, no? And how to set his feet, his feet were set pretty badly, weren't they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Daniel's going, 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 he's got a look on his face, okay? Or sometimes it's called, let's go back here, cognitive learning theory. Okay, we'll get to why it is in a minute, okay? And the person whose theory we're going to talk about, there are a lot of social learning theories, and we're going to talk about the person whose theory we're going to concentrate on is Albert Bandura. He's the last of the giants uh, still alive. I don't know if I should say that. He's an old man, but I'm going to assume he's going to stay alive for a long time. We wish him well. And, and... Bandura started out as a behaviorist and slowly, slowly developed over the course of the years as cognitive theory. Okay, as a matter of fact, the first thing that he said was, come back to me for a second, he posited a, re posited a reinforcement called warmth, right? The kid feeling a, a sense of warmth, not heat, but, you know, warmth from others. You know, holding, kissing, hugging. And Skinner said, warmth? What are you talking about? Warmth is not a behavior, a, an observable behavior. Bandura said, ah, everybody knows what behaviors constitute warmth. Skinner said to him, I'm warning you, if you take one step toward, a, toward this, posit something inside, before you know it, you'll be a cognitive theorist about all kinds of things. Bandura said, eh. But Skinner was right. Yeah, I mean, Skinner was older than Bandura, right? Skinner was right. Okay, here's what he says. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. What people think, believe, and feel affects how they behave. So it's not just environmental contingencies that affect how you behave. Your own thoughts, your own beliefs, your own feelings affect how you behave. And the natural extrinsic effects of their actions and their acts and how they behave in turn, partly determines their thought patterns and their affective. Affect is a fancy word for emotional, their affective reactions. So I'll, let me translate this too. And when you behave in a certain way, and there are consequences to that behavior, right? You do something, and it affects other people, okay? Then that changes your thoughts and your patterns. Okay, it changes your thought patterns and your emotions. You understand what I'm saying? So in other words, 
the very fact, I have a different opinion about Daniel now than I did 15 minutes ago. Because I saw his reaction. How good a golfer are you? You take it pretty seriously? He said no. Okay? But even though he saw Hugo Swing, when I asked him questions, he was kind of reluctant. He had a kind smile on his face. Right? So the fact that these questions, so I have a better opinion about him now. He's a nice guy. He didn't go, God, get that jerk odd down from there, right? He's a nice guy, right? So my behaviors, my asking questions, and the reactions I got to him influenced my thinking, right? Also, I have a, a, a better opinion about Hugo. He's ready to go along, even though I put him in a situation which was uncomfortable here. I never played golf. I told you that here, hit him, show me hitting a golf ball, right? And he's been smiling the whole time, okay? So your opinions about people are the other way around, right? And those opinions, and those opinions can affect both behavior and not engaging in a behavior. I'll give you an example, okay? If you raise your hand, I'm warning you, it's not gonna be the most pleasant thing in the world. Tell me one goal of education, what one goal of education should be, anything. Come on. Come on! I, I'm, we're just playing a game here, it doesn't matter. Go ahead. To learn, to teach. To learn. Did she graduate from high school? What a stupid answer. Okay, somebody else give me an answer. Come on, just do it. Raise your hand and do it. Okay, go ahead. To pass a tacky test. Pass a tacky test. Another idiot heard from. If I do that two or three times, right, no one's going to raise hands again. I'm going to say, okay, who has a question, right? What's changed is, first of all, this guy's a moron. He's, he's, a, he, right? he's a rude, obnoxious human being. Secondly, he's, he's an idiot. Because certainly the first goal <laughs> is a reasonable one. How can, how can anybody insult someone for saying that person education has to learn? And the second one, obviously, is a realistic goal, right? She was being facetious and being a wise guy. I knew that, right? But still, so you get an opinion of me, right? You get an opinion of me. Things have changed. The guy's, a, the guy's rude. He's obnoxious. He's a jerk. And you have an evaluation of me. He doesn't know what he's talking about. How can anyone in his right mind not thinking that learning is at least one legitimate goal, that that's at least a legitimate opinion about what education should be about? And that affects your, then you fail to behave. Uh, can somebody please tell me something? Just sit there to say nothing. Well, am I going to put up with this abuse? Who cares what he thinks? Okay, you understand what I'm saying? It's going to affect you not to behave. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So, Skinner's is an environmental determinist, right? The environment and the, the, in, the uh, reinforcements and the punishments in the environment determine the person's behavior. But Bandura is a reciprocal determinist. It's, it's reciprocal, okay? The environment can determine what happens to you, and you, in turn, can influence the environment. Come back to me. I'll give you an example. As long as we're picking on Hugo... Um, let's say uh, Hugo's behavior is to cease and desist from taking showers for the rest of the semester. Okay, this is a silly example, but I guarantee you that the seating pattern in this class will change radically by the end of the semester, right? There'll be nobody on that side of the room where he's sitting, okay? So, I mean, that's a silly example, but you get the idea, okay? What, what, you, what, you, what you do can change the environment, the environment can change you, and there's a constant reciprocity between the two, okay? So let's get some basic principles of social learning theory. I'll, I'll explain this in more detail, okay? The primary focus is on learning that occurs in a social context, within a social context, okay? Just the way, and, and the social context needn't be, you can be by yourself watching TV, right? But social means observing the environment. That's how you go learn the basics of, of, the, of, of the golf club. Standing sideways, swinging it over his shoulder, meeting the ball. I mean, he didn't come up and try to hit the ball this way. He came sideways and tried to hit it there. Okay? Even though he, he may have watched that when he was alone. 
Okay, it's a social context. Secondly, reinforcement plays a role in learning, but it's not entirely responsible for learning. Other things come in. Cognitive processes play a crucial role in learning. Okay? People can learn through observation. That's one of the keys of the social context. And learning can occur without a change in behavior. Just like you learned not to change your behavior, just to sit and not raise your hand based upon what you observed about me. That I'm obnoxious and stupid. Okay? So, here's what he says. Human development reflects an interaction of a thinking, active thinking person, behavior in the environment. All those things interact together. A person is not solely shaped by the environment. The links are bi-directional. Anyone can influence the other, and here's his famous triangle. This is what Skinner says. This is Skinner, a one-way arrow that says the environment influences the behavior. That's what he says. Okay? <clears throat> but in turn, the behavior can influence the environment, right? Oops. You can get, right, a person who acts a certain way in a group can really make changes in how the group functions. Right? Ever been in a group where just one person, you change everything you do in a group to avoid having this person, you know, having an influence anymore or the other way around. A certain person can be in a group and act in a certain way and the group gets more cohesive or less cohesive, more, etc. Okay? Likewise, the person, okay, a person's behavior can affect the person, right? You see what I'm saying? If, I, if you do certain things, Nuts. If you do certain, I don't know what's going on here. If you do certain things, thank you. This is for posterity, right, on film. If you do certain things and there are, and there are environmental reactions to it, that can change your thoughts or your feelings. You understand what, you're, what I'm saying? That can change your thoughts or your feelings about how to do things. If you have a way to do things and it's unsuccessful, you can start to think, gee, maybe I should do it a different way. Or if you have a way to do things that are, that are successful, but in the end you have a knot in your stomach, right? You might say, you know, this is not worth it to me. I'm not going to do this anymore. My son had a job a temporary job where, you know, he, I have a son who's a stand-up comic, so obviously he's a gift of gab, right? And he was raising money for charities. A lot of those people who call you to raise money for charities, right? They're, they're, they're not, you know, volunteers. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. The charity pays people a certain percentage of the take. And he came home, he was raising money for a charity, I remember which one it was, but it was one you could really get into, cancer or heart, and it was a legit charity. He said, he said, I can't do this anymore. He said, people call me, and he won that day, he ran the most money. He said, people call me, but it's obvious they don't have money. And my job is to say, oh, come on, what's five bucks, what's 10 bucks? He said, I just can't do it. He said, I called up one lady, he said, I'm on Social Security. He said, and, and he said, I'm going through the, you know, the line that they gave us. He said, I hung up and I got sick. He said, she really couldn't afford it. He said, it's a good cause, but I, I can't do that. And it changed his whole, it changed his attitude. He, he never did that again. And he was considering sales and he said, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. I, I'm not gonna do that. I'm telling you. And he went into something else and gives a gift of gab and <laughs> became a stand-up comic. But, so it changed his attitude. The reactions of the people that he heard changed his attitude. And likewise, the environment can change your attitude about things, right? Certain things that occur in the environment can change your, right, the, the nature of the environment. You can go into a place that can change your attitude about people or about things. I remember I, I knew someone, she graduated from high school early. I was her counselor in a youth group. So she gets out, she barely turned 17. She goes into um, 
uh, uh, she was she went to New York City. She we, I was living in New York City at the time. She goes in this line to register for college, and the line was endlessly long, and bureaucratic stuff. And she's standing there with, and there are people who know how to you know con the system. You can't take this kid. Hey, you know they know how to. And she was just hopelessly lost. And she went, you know, and just the nature of the environment and the impersonality of the environment. And the end, she said, I don't want to go to college. She dropped out. Years later, she finally went back. Now she has a master's degree and she's a master teacher. So I've, I've stayed in contact with her because of it. both in this, the ed biz. But you, you understand what I'm saying. It's, it's that can change it. Likewise, and perhaps most important, the person attitudes and ideas can drastically affect that person's analysis of another person's behavior, of behaviors, and of the environment. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? Your own attitudes, your own background. Westbury High School used to have a Confederate flag for its for its uh, mascot thing. Go ahead. Well, push it down, push it down, push it down. I went to Westbury High School and um, I graduated in 99. Uh -huh. They took it down, but it was still there. You could, they painted over it, you could still see through the paint. Yeah, it's still was, there. So, you know, there are some people, like my son, he decided he wanted to go to Westbury. He'd been in a private, he'd been in a private school. He wanted to go to a public school to check it out. He saw that it, it didn't last very long. I mean, it didn't make a big impression on him. He didn't, you know, didn't think about it one way or the other, right? Obviously, there are some students, because of their background, their attitudes, emotions, who reacted very negatively to it. Right? They finally got rid of it. Okay? You know, what it is, what it means. I remember the same thing. They put him down there. He had been in this private school. It was, a, it was a Jewish parochial school. And they put down, and they put down, it had down there race or ethnic. So he's what, he was 13 years old, 14 years old. He looks down, he looks at it, he's looking, and he's got, he said, what do I put? I said, I don't know. He looks, he looks, he said, I don't know what to put. I said, you don't want to put white? He says, oh, no. He says, oh, no. This is, again, the person, right? And his background and where he came from, the kind of slave community, he says, everybody who says white, white power, white pride, he says, they all hate Jews. Right? Most of those, a lot of those groups are very anti-Semitic, right? He said, I'm not putting that down. That was from the background, the kind of intense education he had had, right? So is that what he finally did? He looks down, he looks down. I got my master's degree in Israel. I was studying in Israel when he was born. So he looks and he said, wait a minute, he said. I was born in Asia, right? He said, Israel's in Asia, right? I said, yeah. He said, I was born there, right? He said, yeah. I said, yeah. He said, okay. Check the Asian American, right? <laughs> Off he went. <laughs> he had no idea, right? So what did he know, right? So clearly your background influences so many people. That's just, you know, just check a box. By the way, I will tell you right now, when they ask for race, I put check other and put human. But that's a different question, okay? So he, that's, that's a... So his, his own attitude back influenced, affected what he did, right? Had a, 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 an emotional reaction to one thing. And another thing that some kids had emotional reaction, I mean, the Confederate flag was fine. He didn't care. It's interesting that, that you know, they, they got rid of it. So, and, you know, and the emotion around the flag, uh, you know, that, that comes and goes. So th those kinds of things often depend, right, how you evaluate your environment and even how you evaluate other people's behaviors, right, who you are and what you are. There are some teachers who really, here, let's go back to this for a second, how you evaluate other people's behaviors. I'm going to tell you something now. Come back to me. There are some teachers who really like kids who are wise guys. My wife's one of those. By the way, where I'm from, guy does not mean a male. It's a person. Just a local dialect, right? Come on, you guys. Could be a bunch of, you know, I remember when I used to, Coaching girls softball teams. Come on, you guys, girls, right? So it's uh, so the right. She and, and there was one kid they finally threw out of the school, and she said, I kind of liked him. He was neat and cute, and, and you never know why. I promise you, when you teach, there's going to be a kid 
who everyone thinks goes from, he's a good kid, to I love the kid, they're going to get on your nerves like you wouldn't believe. You go home and say, just one time, like this, right? <laughs> I had a kid like that when I was teaching once. I just, you know, everybody liked her. She was a great kid. There's something about her that rubbed me the wrong way. And my wife and I were teaching the same school. That's actually where we met. And I said, it was just one period I taught. I went in the morning to lead this. It was a parochial school, another different parochial school, a prayer and discussion group. And I saw half an hour a day, you know, before I'd come to the university. Just bugged me, right? And I explained what it was. I said, she's sneaking. She said, well, you're going overboard. You're nuts. Obviously, it's something inside of me that caused me to have this tremendous negative reaction to the kid. When that happens to you, and I promise you it will, right? Hang on. It's because you're nuts, not because of the kid, right? And we're all nuts. So we get to fight. You'll see that, right? It's something with you that's rubbing you the wrong way that's out of bounds, especially if other people don't see it. And sometimes it'll be the other way around. There'll be a kid that other people say, this kid's driving me nuts, and you'll really like this kid. Something about it, just it's just okay. You can see it all, you still like the kid, okay? That's also something you personally, when that happens, you really have a responsibility, whether you want it or not, right? Whether you want it or not, you're, you're reacting to the environment, to the way that kid is, right? And to that behavior and how he or she is acting in the environment, in a way that has something to do with you as a person. And this Bendura, you know, taught us well. And you're going to have to be warm to that kid and nurturing to that kid and even maybe try to protect that kid, tell that kid, I accept you. There was one kid in the same school. He, he, his father had died when he was young. You know, he was one of these kids with three older brothers and then he was much younger than they were. His father died from cancer and he was seventh grade and he was just miserable. The brothers tried to fill in and it was hard and he was full of anger and rage and that and that. And he would do things like, and he, was, and he made faces of people. Right? He would make faces at people. So one day he made a face at me, and I went like this. I said, make faces? I can make faces. Oh, All right, I made a face at him. And he goes like this, and I knew he was laughing. He turned around, right? I said to him, I caught you, you're laughing. I said, and we became best buddies after that, right? But I liked him. I li he drove all the other teachers, and they really, a lot of them really didn't like him, right? And, and it, it became clear to me, I have to be with I have to try to, hard to be with this kid. And, and it, it helped. It really helped. The parents actually called and said, let him be at the conference, right? So these are the kinds of things that, that you, you need to worry about. Because you as a person, your personality is deep inside what you do. It sits out there, whether you like it or not. And you have to be careful. How many people have a need for real order and orderliness? Yeah? How many people are driven crazy, driven crazy by people like that? Okay? You have to be careful. Right? You have to be careful. If there's a kid who's a good student and isn't particularly orderly, you have to be careful not to try to impose it. We'll get that more when we get to Freud. But you've got to be careful about all these things. And Bandura tells us that the a classroom or any social situation is an interplay of people, their thoughts, their emotions, what's really going on, the reinforcements in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's, we have a couple more minutes. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Bandura talks about two kinds of learning, observational learning. Modeling, which is what you did when you all, you know, clap, clap, slap, slap, right? And vicarious learning. Okay, vicarious reinforcement and punishment. Let's start with modeling here. Okay, let's, let's get a start on it. Okay, this is the process of learning by watching and repeating a behavior. That's how you go, had a basic idea of how to swing a golf club, and that's how all of you were able to do the silly thing I showed you how to do. And this explains the learning of a complex behavior in one or a few trials. Let's see if we can get my picture in there. So in other words, my going slap, slap, this, like this, and like this, and like this. That's a fairly complex behavior. Hugo knew how to stand sideways, grip the thing, put his hand up. Right? That's a fairly complex behavior. He did it, you know, just watching it or in a few trials. The clapping, just about everybody got right watching me twice. Okay? This process implies cognition thinking, since you have to remember what you saw. 
okay? Hugo obviously has not seen somebody swing a golf club for hours and hours and hours, probably days and days, right? <laughs> He's going like this, yeah? But he remembered. That's a cognitive process, something that Skinner has no use for, okay? And Bandura talks about four conditions for effective modeling. You have to pay attention. You have to be able to remember to retain it. You have to be able to do it. I can observe Michael Jordan all that I want. I'm not going to be able to do it. I can observe Biggio all I want. I'm not going to be able to do it. Okay? And you have to be motivated, right? Or I could observe knitting all day, and I don't care. I tried to knit once to relax. I dropped a stitch. I had to tear out three things. I'm going to try to be crazy, right? I don't care. Okay? So next time, we're, gonna, we're going to talk about these and the effects for these things, and then we're going to talk about what an effective model uh, is really like and have some warnings. And how many people have heard this thing? Be a role model for the students. Be a role model for the students. Be a role model. You heard that, what, 5,000 times? That's from, from Bandura. Okay. See you next time.